At the Center for Artistic Activism, we kind of believe in this expansive view of how we can get these things done, right? That there are a wealth of options and that we can be successful. But in order to, you have to kind of understand all the different possibilities. And so today we're going to be talking with three different activists who have used kind of small efforts to have a big impact. First is Astra Taylor. You might know some of her books. Um, she's also a documentary filmmaker, but uh, maybe lesser known is that she's one of the founders of the Debt Collective. Um, and if you've heard about canceling student loan debt in the last couple of years, it started because of what Astra and the Debt Collective did. Um, I don't think they realized how far they were gonna get at the beginning, but their um, efforts had a huge impact. Uh, next is Ricardo Dominguez. Ricardo uh, has uh, these sort of more poetic gestures that ended up really upsetting um, the FBI <laughs> and um, having this huge uh, impact on the news, um, but starting with something very small, like an aid to help someone get across the border that included these sort of more thoughtful poetic gestures. And it is, it's an example that we've used at the Center for Artistic Activism for about a decade. The third is Nikola Pisarev. Nikola is um, one of our collaborators in North Macedonia. He's trained with us. I've traveled with him. Um, he is very funny um, and has done a lot of um, small actions in North Macedonia that end up having massive effects. Um, they did these sort of uh, projects around infrastructure and corruption in North Macedonia that I think they estimate has um, resulted in 15 million euros in investment in infrastructure in the country. Um, so very successful with very small actions. And I hope this will be inspiring or motivating to you and, and give you some ideas. Uh, so let's get started with the smallish uh, projects in revolutionizing activism today. So uh, let's start with Nicola. And this is an action I actually, I don't know that I know uh, before, but um, the Guinness World Record of delayed street building. Um, and we have some video that you can show of that. What was the problem you're trying to solve and how did it work? Yeah, the problem was very, very simple. Uh, the municipality, this is part of, of Skopje where 10, 15 years ago, it was a uh, full of houses and then decide to change your room plan and make buildings. And more or less, uh, it was maybe time to, to change that, that part of the city because it was old houses. They were not the, the, the urbanist plan said we have buildings there. Uh, there was no big resistance of, of the people and etc. And they start building, but they forget one. Actually, this is main street of for about... Uh, 7,000 people with is long two kilometers and they during the building of, of this these old new blocks they uh, ruined the old street and then they start fixing and then something happened and then stop and, and uh, the process was stopped one month two months three and more months nothing was happening people were it was impossible for the people to go home they were you have to walk with things with because the new buildings to to take on, on hand, all the furniture and everything, four or five hundred meters in order in order to to get in their their buildings, and uh, this is part of the Skopje where I live near near my my uh, my house. And this, fuck, what is this? This is totally not totally crazy. And then uh, I start asking people who know that I know that working municipality, what are you doing? And they said we are doing nothing. We are doing nothing, but. All settlement, half of the municipality cannot pass, cannot go, kids cannot go in the school, you need boots all the time if it's rainy or, or whatever. So there's and like then, equipment and materials and debris like everywhere, basically. Yeah, yeah. And that we were thinking what to do, not to make big mobilization with petitions, with protests. No, it's like, let's try make it simple. And at that time, when we were doing action, Macedonia have three failures to enter Guinness World of Records. We tried to make biggest pot of beans, then we tried to make some biggest pie and some biggest burger, and all three attempts failed. <laughs> uh, so then it was just 
we were looking i was looking at the tv we were in the gallery watching the news actually on, on facebook or something like that so again we didn't enter the guineas and, and then somehow like like arrow i thought someone mentioned we should make a guinness and we have a the street and then this this part of skopje which is for guinness because four months is they are not working anything and then that that was all after that yeah. we make that it's very funny funny text in, in local slang it's written on the end and the official ceremony when guinness representatives will give us the award there will be barack obama will come uh pope benedict the third will come some mythic figure like king marco from 17th century and i think and people like that will come and when we we put several of of this science on the on the street and it became violent became become crazy the people start make selfie with the with the with, the, with sign. the sign and everyone start speaking about that so for a street of 7000 people a city with 700000 people all scopy was speaking all all morning and all all day about that the media it was all the 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 the, the media were there speaking with local people trying to find answers in the in the in the municipality and very quickly after that i think three or four just three or four days after the the guinness the in the action they start working and they finish the street in something like three weeks after that wow and i mean that's one example but i i know several from working with you of like you do an action and within days the yeah. city responds and the thing gets fixed and i remember you telling me you've totaled it up and it's like over 15 million euros in infrastructure yes. projects that you <laughs> yes yeah because it's, it's something like it's probably public shaming and and but also it's everything in the in the western balkan probably in 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 south europe also it's about votes a number of votes of people yeah. so the politicians look on the people like numbers like a vote so anything within this is disturbing and destroying that 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 numbers making the the change of the numbers is a threat so yeah. it's it, and if a threat is like in this because they first they don't know who is doing that second they cannot say anything against guinness or whatever they say they will just promote the idea and then the cheapest way and the easiest way probably for them is to to fix the problem right 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 you like put make that the easiest thing to do and then they do it um so it sounds like you guys are sitting around. I mean, this is how a lot of great ideas happen is a bunch of people sitting around and make a joke. And then it's like, hey, what if we did that? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's this other project that you have with the, uh, that involved penguins. Yes. And I'm wondering where the idea came for this. And I'll, like, is it the same sort of um, sitting around and talking about what we could do? Or like, how do you come, how, how often do you come up with these ideas? Well, uh, this, 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 this is part of something that was, bigger and then we need it was last year you know the the tensions with the with the gas with the fuels and everything prices start growing very much and there was there was uh in january skopje is a little bit continental city macedonia is continental country even in south europe but at, at winter temperatures are going down up to minus 20 at night mm -hmm. sometimes so it's very cold and there was a big chance that we will be without heating mm -hmm. because of some administrative procedures between the government between the company which is publicly owned again by the city and that all legal things they didn't fix on time it was threat that uh, around 500,000 people of uh, people in Skopje or uh, 200,000 apartments will be without heating so then we need something to mobilize uh, to inform people what might happen but also to 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 pull media in the in the story and everything and we have we used to say at winter when it's very cold how are you i'm like a penguin i feel like a penguin i walk like a penguin because when, when it's frozen the city is usually not cleaned well and then the doctors all the time and winter say if there is snow or there is ice go penguin walk small steps be careful not so to just like a through. local saying yeah I'm yeah it's penguin. yeah i'm called like a penguin it's it's a it's a uh you know it's it's local slang so then it's we decide to make penguins they make make these sculptures of the penguins and walk around with, with, with you'll, you'll see uh several pictures 
Yeah. We were all day practically traveling with the penguins everywhere. And the people were coming, making selfies with the ping- penguins, and uh, they they understand uh, very quickly the the whole city uh, know the story about the penguins, but also also get in, very well informed about the 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 possible problem that will approach. And it that was I think it was middle of Jan. We make the action something uh, middle of January and the expiring date for finishing all the procedures and buying new uh, fuel for everything was end of January. Mm-hmm. And that was that was sort of, you know, we make sometimes, many times, we have two sorts of action. We speak uh, with you many times. Some are to instantly uh, fix the problem like Guinness, but some actions are made to be on the, to, to, to show what people think to the, uh-huh. Uh-huh. to the, to the authorities to be what to be in the in the same in the same direction with with the common people and to to speak about about the problems uh, people have. So this this action with penguins was actually that. Let's yeah, yeah, speak yeah. about about uh, possibility that was very big that we will stay all all city will be without heating in the middle of the winter. Yeah, it's like you're articulating something that people are thinking, and we yes. talked about this with around yes. corruption yes. where. Yes. There's yes. people are ashamed to participate in corruption, right? And yes. but, although everyone has to, because it's part of how you navigate a corrupt system, right? Like it, being a victim of it means being a participant. Yeah, yeah. And, actually, have... and like but being it... able to allow people to speak about that is actually part of like moving the issue forward. And I'm I'm going to go to Astra because I think that's part of what the debt collective does, right? It's like there's a shame around debt. And feeling like, oh, I, I, you know, I messed up. Although so many of us have debt, um, uh, we have that that shame around it. So let's start with that. Like, was that sort of the beginning of the idea? Student debt relief was not on the national agenda a few years ago, and you put it on the national agenda, and it got done. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the Debt Collective is the country's first union for debtors, um, and you know, our to your point, we all have debt. Uh, And one of our phrases is, you know, we're not in debt because we live beyond our means, but because we are denied the means to live. We live in a society where we're forced to debt finance the necessities of life, whether that's education, healthcare, you know, putting food on the table because you're making minimum wage, you know, who can really make ends meet at 725 an hour or because, you know, we treat housing as a speculative asset, not a right. And yet we're also told to feel bad about it. This is the American way, right? Is to make people feel bad for being poor, make people feel bad for being in debt. And and so we are uh, absolutely militant about the idea that that debtors shouldn't feel ashamed. This is a a structural problem and structural problems require structural solutions. Um, We have our origins in the Occupy Wall Street movement and Occupy Wall Street was, you know, essentially, uh, you know, this amazing protest that that was more than a protest it was they you know people formed these encampments and held space for weeks or months and so uh at zuccotti park in new york city you know this is a little over 10 years ago people were talking about the financial crisis the global financial crisis that was happening at the time uh, and started talking about their financial struggles and listening you know we just started talking and listening and realizing oh everybody's in debt (laughs) you know nobody uh nobody Felt that they would ever own a home, right? You know, one thing I like to say is the American dream is now not owning your own home; it's it's having zero dollars. It's actually like getting out of debt. Um, mm. And uh, and it was through those conversations, um, you know, Occupy had a really playful spirit. Uh, I love seeing the the playful images of of creative protests. And Occupy was messy. There were lots of things about it, but it was really cre- It was this really you know inspiring environment where anything. It kind of felt like anything anything could be tested or tried. Um, and so, you know, we started, again, we started meeting, we started talking, um, we started casting away that shame and building solidarity as debtors. And then we're like, wow, if the banks got bailed out, uh, why couldn't we bail out each other? So we started something called the Rolling Jubilee, which was a bailout of the people by the people where we figured out how to buy debt that was on the secondary debt market. So unsecured debts like people's old medical bills or payday loans or probation debts. And um, we crowdfunded for that. And then we raised ten, ultimately tens of millions of dollars. And then we're like, wow, instead of buying and erasing debts, what if we 
fought? <laughs> what if we fought back and forced the creditor or the government to cancel them? Um, all, all the while having the bigger political shift in mind, like ultimately what we need is free education so people don't have to take out student loans. Ultimately, we need universal health care so that people don't have to take out uh, medical debt. Um, sort of organizing and be, you know, sort of building a membership, building our first uh, subsection of the union, sort of really demanding student debt cancellation. You know, at first, you know, whatever the experts, the journalists, the commentators were like, that's ridiculous. These occupiers are like high on their own supply and um, just were unrelenting, you know, and had a really strong coupled like creative interventions with what we call economic disobedience. So debt strikes, we're saying, no, we can't pay our debts. We won't pay our debts. And then a policy shop sort of doing our research and figuring out like, hey, these are the laws on the books. It turns out the president can cancel student loans. Guess what? It turns out, you know, that these bail companies are violating consumer protection law. You know, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of powers out there that could be wielded for good. We just started to relentlessly push the powers that be on those issues and here we are where the president has, you know, after 10 years, uh, you know, President Biden has spent his career serving the financial sector, serving creditors, has announced the cancellation of what, by some estimates, is $400 billion of student debt. Unfortunately, he didn't listen to our advice totally. We told him to cancel it all and cancel it immediately. He had the authority yeah. to do that. They freaking made this application, it took them weeks to even announce it. And that bought time for an incredibly well-funded right wing to cook up like six or seven bogus lawsuits line them up with Republican judges. So now, um, you know, now we're in a potentially bad situation. Yeah, uh, and yeah. which is, you know, an argument, again, like listen to the weirdos from Occupy because we told you how to do it. <laughs> do it in a way that wouldn't be stymied by the right wing. Um, the last thing I'll say on that and is that, you know, in these lawsuits against unit cancellation, the people bringing them, you know, for example, one in Texas is, a group called the Job Creators Network is behind it. It's it's the billionaire evil guy who founded Home Depot, who's also union busting. It's the Mercer family. They're actually laying bare all of the things that we've been saying for 10 years. We've been saying, you know, debt is a, a tool of social control. It's a tool of racial domination. And, you know, these folks are saying it out loud. They're saying, how will the military recruit if we cancel student debt? How will we, how will we keep our employees if we don't get to entice them with little bits of student debt forgiveness? This is reverse racism because it helps black people. Um, they're saying it all. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and they have the money to protect their interests, which is what they're doing. But, you know, all of these things we've been saying about the, the social purpose of debt is now just on the, on the public record. Yeah, and it, I, there's a couple things in there. Um, one is just like that your simple way is actually probably better and more efficient and more foolproof, you know. But also, I remember talking to Th your your you know collaborator Thomas Goki about, and he was like, "All we have to do is get Biden to sign this one piece of paper, right? Yeah. Like you figured out that that was the the leverage point. That there was really, I mean, that would have done it. Like if you could get him to sign this one." one yeah document and then he's like i think he was telling me he was trying to make a bunch of copies of it and and like everywhere biden went hand him a pen and that piece of paper and be like can you sign this you know um which i don't know how well that works it's kind of a long shot but um i like that idea of like that you figured out what where those points are and yeah. that you could buy you know going back to what you were talking about earlier you could buy debt for like cents on the dollar um, it's that's another leverage point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to your point. So it is true that, you know, one thing we discovered in our research was that President Biden has had the executive authority to cancel student debt. We've been proven correct because he actually invoked the exact authority we were calling on him to use. Um, it is hard to get a piece of paper in front of the president. So what we did was we created a, a you know, a beautiful PDF that had a little sign here, you know, a sign, I think it was like orange or red. And we got thousands and thousands of people to basically tweet it at the White House, email it to the White House. We had huge um, versions of it at protests outside the Department of Education. And why? You know, because it's so important to educate the public about the fact that, again, there's all of these this power that could be used for good. You know, the people, mm -hmm. you know, Democrats <laughs> are often, you know, sitting on their hands saying, oh, it's too bad. I can't do anything. I'm being blocked by Republicans. I mean, sometimes Republicans block things, but, you know, they really say, no, you actually can do this. And, and the people who need to know that, again, are just regular folks like us, you know, because mm -hmm. what it does is it there's an imaginative component to that. It's like, whoa, what if I lived in a world where the president 
picked up the pen and canceled student debt. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, it's possible. And uh, and so, you know, I think a lot of people who focus on policy and are as wonky and nerdy as we are, they often are only playing that inside game, right? They're they're mm -hmm. you know they're aiming you know at at I don't know what they're doing. They're writing white papers and meeting with administrators and stuff like that. Whereas we are kind of using those policy insights as a form of radical political education. Like you should be mad, mad as hell that people can actually do good things and they're not. <laughs> but let's yeah. not let them pretend that these things are impossible. You know, the other thing that I'm reminded of is that you're a writer and um, I, I'm not saying that you come up with every slogan that the Debt Collective uses, but a lot of them are really beautiful. Like you are not a loan. And yeah. what you said before of like people aren't in debt because they go beyond their means, you know, and, I don't, I'm not, mm -hmm. I can't, can you say it again? It was... yeah. We're not in debt because we live beyond our means, but because we're denied the means to live. Um, yeah, I mean, there's like a beauty yeah. even to that phrase and that you're bringing that into it also. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good way to move to Ricardo too, because Ricardo, is your background, like, we, uh, did you ever call yourself a poet? Oh, uh, no. Theater, right? Uh, not at all. I am. <laughs> uh, my history is within um, traditions of Agiprop Theater back in the 70s with Teatro Campesino, Bread and Puppet Theater, Living Theater. Um, but uh, in the early 80s with a Critical Art Ensemble in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, we began to explore um, uh, what we call the conversation between butterflies and strange attractors and that is utopian plagiarism, uh, wherein we started doing poetry in order to think uh, in a very fast manner. So we would cut and paste into classic poetry uh, notions of uh, the digital, the electronic, uh, data bodies and real bodies, because in the early 80s, we didn't have computers. We can only sort of imagine and one of the outcomes of utopian plagiarism uh, as a poetic form in the early 80s was taking on heroes on civil disobedience from 1848. And we just put electronic in front of uh, every moment that he mentioned civil disobedience. So very quickly, we had the book of electronic civil disobedience uh, develop. And part of our early thinking in the 80s was um, what was the relationship between data bodies and real bodies, uh, capitalism and virtual capitalism, and how would electronic civil disobedience uh, allow a kind of um, disturbance, if you will, of that territory? Again, it was within this uh, paradigm of not having computers right at that time. Uh, yeah. Another element, which is probably a, a part of the conversation that Nicola and Astra are pointing to uh, and, and the conversation here is small gestures or what we called micro gestures in the in the early 80s. And micro gestures were a way to create a disturbance in the social uh, field in which communities would gather with power or the representation of power and try to figure out what was going on, right? And so an early micro gesture uh, that uh, we did was investigating what was a very new component of culture in the late 70s and early 80s was the mauling of America, right? And so in Tallahassee, Florida, we got the very first mall that anybody had seen and so we wanted to explore what a mall was. And we discovered that it was a simulation of public culture, of public space, but the only right you had was to purchase commodities. It wasn't an agora. So what I did is I went in and bought $20 worth of commodities. And then instead of taking those commodities home, like a good commodity fetishist, I just broke it out right in front of the doors of the mall. I wasn't blocking the doors or anything, but I started playing with my Hot Wheels, my Burger King hat and what have you. And very quickly, community gathered, uh, security forces came and they were trying to figure out, was this a Vietnam vet? Was this somebody who was unable to understand what commodities were for? Um, and often it led to almost being arrested. 
So one of the things that came out of that was that one could develop micro gestures that were like butterfly effects that would mm -hmm. create a strange attractor that then would allow communities to discuss what exactly a mall was, what was being secure, what was public. Uh, we also began to examine what the ideas of data bodies and real bodies were and how virtual capitalism might deem data bodies more valuable than real bodies. And this would eventually uh, remove the streets as being valuable. So if you were an activist and you wanted to take the streets, virtual capital didn't care. They only right. cared about the value of your data body. So those were the ideas in our performative matrix. And then in the mid 80s, many of our friends began to die of an unknown disease. HIV AIDS came to the foreground. Uh, so like many other activists, we started developing uh, uh, our own ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, uh, to mobilize groups from Miami uh, heading towards Atlanta, where NIH was. And part of our, uh, our work was to develop local tactical uh, actions that we call cultural vaccines at that time. And what this was, was that there was a lot of hysteria around uh, HIV AIDS, right? Even talking to people on screen uh, could create contagion. That's how his, the hysteria was. So for instance, um, early tactical media or micro gestures were that there was a big store called Publix in the South, sort of yeah. like Whole Foods now. And in, in response to AIDS, HIV, they decided not to sell condoms anymore. And so we at ACT UP Tallahassee thought this was not a very good response. So one gesture was, well, we could go protest and do direct action. Or the other suggestion was positive critique. Uh, and so we said, we love Publix. We love buying our condoms at Publix. It's the best of all stores in Tallahassee. You know, and we want to buy your you know, condoms. And so after two weeks of fax jamming them, uh, call jamming them with positive response. We love you, Publix. They finally said, Act Up Tallahassee, we'll, we're going to bring back condoms. And we said, yay, but can you put them up front? Because sometimes we're really on the move and we don't have time to go to the back to find them. Yeah. So it was- You got somebody in you, bed, you don't want to keep them waiting. Yeah, yeah, I, I got to go really quick. <laughs> so it allowed us to conceive that micro gestures could be uh, contestational, could be transgressive, could uh, create impossibilities, uh, and it could also tactically create a, a positive activism. That is, you yeah. tell the people, and later on we saw that with another action called Park Fiction in Hamburg, uh, which is sort of like uh, Nikolai. In, in the late 80s, um, there was a park that was never built in Hamburg. And one day the people woke up in this neighborhood and saw a huge condominium was going to be built and had big billboard, like the future of this space. And so then they, they started going, we have to protest, but then they decided let's cover these billboards with the future park. And then uh, they started calling the mayor and the council saying, it's so amazing that after 20 years of not creating this park, your organization has taken on this bank, this architecture, uh, and they brought flowers to the mayor and there was news everywhere that the park was going to be created. And then the park was created, right? Um, so the park fiction. So yeah. all of this uh, developed then into the practice of um, uh, amplifying tactical media, uh, micro gestures, and eventually towards the practice of uh, real electronic civil disobedience. Uh, against corporations, nation states, and other entities that we deemed um, that should be sort of directly developed by data bodies in protest. And uh, this was in conjunction with the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, uh, uh, starting on January 1994. So I don't know, I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely some stuff I wanna come back to. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about all of you, and and um, and I, I, maybe this is a way, Ricardo, for you to talk about the transborder immigrant tool, but I was talking to a group of students yesterday and um, something came up where they're like, you know, 
basically, I realized early on that a, a mistake I would often make is not imagining that how the project would have the impact that it had. I thought about the project and how to do it, but not what would happen as a result, you know? And the responses that you all have had um, are in many ways like massive, like national policy. Um, Nicola, it's like the, you know, you, it's a small country, but like you've made these huge changes in how they spend their money. And Ricardo, like you, you got the ire of the FBI, you know. Um, how much of that did you anticipate? Um, when you began, did you hope that you would get to where you are now? Or was it, you know, how, how do you think about it early on and what lessons did you learn in that way? At the beginning, you know, when we start something, we start, start to just to do it, just to yeah. try to find a solution. And then it's developing. When it's small thing, it's easy. When it's something different, like, you know, the story for drinking water in Gevgelia, we said, okay, let's start speaking about the, the, Pollute poison water, drinking yeah. water that is going in the in the in the in the pipes of of Gelia, and we just want to speak about that loudly, and then you get different responses from different side. So people uh, sometimes they they uh, encourage you by asking you do something again, do something again, help us. They organize and then you you help those group that organize after the 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 initial actions so those are all the things which are which are different from case to case from action to to action so mm -hmm. there is no rule uh sometimes nothing is happening uh so we have to repeat the the action to make second to make third action with on a on a same or similar topic and then things start uh start changing sometimes we even uh do actions that are that are not which are targeted to civil society to start working. When we were speaking about pollution, we are not environmental engineers. We are not biologists 10, 15 years ago. We, we were guessing that air in Skopje is very polluted, but no one have exact data what is happening. So we, we mm -hmm. start speaking, make crazy things, uh, giving breathing masks to people, bringing fresh mountain air in a in a giant in a giant bags, putting some snorkels who want to take it without having appropriate uh, data, but no one have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then actually, the the people did the, the the support was not important to us, but it was important that people start asking uh, environmental organization, what are you doing with this problem? They were actually the 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 one that were pressured pressured uh, to the wall to start work there yeah uh, for f fulfilling their missions and then that all that all start and and the, the big fight with the government with the state with did you from, anticipate the, that response from like civil society to come and investigate was like that the goal when you began or was it like no, let's just do something no, and yeah yeah our yeah, as artists as 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 that sort of of people for for us it's better to do something than not do than do, doing nothing so yeah we're doing sometimes we are we are shooting in empty it's it's also true sometimes we do something about something 10 years before we should 10 years ago we start speaking about corruption no one support us no one people are saying come on you don't know what are you talking 10 years after we are doing again small actions different things about corruption and now we are, we are hitting the target. Yeah. It's not connected. It's just that sometimes you will miss. So the percent, if you miss 10, 20 percent of the action, eh, it's 80 percent. You hit. It's great. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, the process again for us is interesting because sometimes we have to do it. For example, in COVID, to speak against what? First few months of COVID, everyone are terrified. No one doing nothing. Everything was stopped and said, okay, what to do now? To speak against COVID, it's a virus. You cannot, you cannot fight with that because no one is, it's no one's fault to speak against Chinese. Again, it's stupid because we are not sure how that thing. Shows. Yeah. So, okay, let's do something to inform public to do things like that. To at least to, to be in a to be in a condition to do something, and then great great actions come out. UN was using some of the sculptures we done in that period. Those hands, not do not don't shake, don't, don't right, shake right, right, right. your hands, and after. We make some slippers and things like that. So it's, you know, for us, it's important 
to do something and also is to do to to hear the voice of powerless to voice of citizens uh and to combine sometimes to combine uh moments when something is important and we can we can easily easier like a guinness after three attempts then you make guinness yeah, yeah i have this note on that. my desk uh that says the future is a fog that reminds me that like you can't you can't always know that the outcome i mean i we as much as possible we try to plan for that kind of thing because you're more likely to succeed but there's certain things you just have to move forward and then as you move forward it becomes yes. more clear so astra like i know I, did that, did it kind of evolve? I mean, because in a way it, you have that thing where you're trying to foster a movement and there's a lot of outcomes that can come out of that. And then you have some really specific things too. How did that evolve for you all? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's interesting to think about how our ambitions grew and grew and grew because in the early days at Occupy, I mean, Occupy was, you know, part of Occupy, Pi's spirit was that it wouldn't make demands of the state, right? Because it was a, you know, a, a kind of revolutionary uh, uh, gathering, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it was basically saying the, the whole system's illegitimate. And, and you know, it's, it's actually, it's our job to kind of say that, to say that there's something deeply broken about our economy and our democracy. Um, you know, and, and the debt collective now, 10 years later is, you know, again, we, we are, you know, inspired by the labor movement. We do make demands, you know, we've been demanding very clearly that Joe Biden cancel this cancel federal student loans that, you know, uh, bail debt is canceled that we're, we also work on rent debt in California. So we are, um, you know, uh, but we, we sort of come from that, that origin where, you know, at that point, I didn't have much experience as an organizer. I was a filmmaker and a writer. <laughs> and so there was like this big conceptual thing of like, yeah, we need to change everything. But who are we? You know, we're just here in this park talking and brainstorming and maybe get, we're going to do some creative projects. Um, my foray into the debtor organizing, you know, my first project that Occupy was editing something called the Occupy Gazette. And it was just like, I knew how to write. I knew how to edit. So I found my other writer, editor friends, and we made like a really beautiful printed newspaper that mm -hmm. collected stories from occupies around the world. And that's what we felt like we could do. <laughs> and then I started, you know, a lot of my pieces ultimately were about debt. And, uh, and then it was like, oh, well, why don't we make a pamphlet that's just about debt? So we wrote something called the Debt Resisters Operations Manual that was a kind of, you know, f radical financial literacy, <laughs> you know, so not just don't eat avocado toast and don't buy your lattes and pay off your debts, but hey, here's how the system's rigged against you. Here's how you cannot pay <laughs> and still survive. Yeah. Um, and wow, wouldn't it be cool if we had power in numbers and we actually worked together? So then we gave away something like 100,000 copies of that. And we're like, well, that's cool. It's bigger than we were before. And then we started the Rolling Jubilee and we, our ambition was to raise $50,000 and erase $1 million of medical debt. And then we went viral and we raised 700,000. So we raised $32 million. And then we thought, well, we can't stop here. What we really want to do is organize power to win, you know, to force debt cancellation. So we had bought a portfolio of debt from a predatory for-profit college and we met the students and we said, hey, we're erasing some of your debt, but wouldn't it be cool if we actually fought and got all your debt canceled? <laughs> mm. And I mean, it was so pie in the sky. You know, mm -hmm. it was wacky. We basically were like, look, the, the school has forced you to sign your rights away. You can't sue, you know, you're shit out of luck with the things how they are. So why don't we try something? Yeah. <laughs> and we we created this application, a mobile application, because a lot of people don't have printers, right? They don't have computers at home so that people could dispute their debts through another obscure legal loophole we found. And we were like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if one person from every state, so 50 people submitted disputes? Well, tens of thousands of people ultimately it's been disputes and we put them all in a red box to symbolize the the red square which was a movement of the student protests in montreal and quebec right where they were saying we're squarely in the red we're in debt so we painted this red square this box and we slammed you know a few hundred disputes on the desk of a you know a bureaucrat at the department of education we're like take that and it just kept growing but it kept growing through these little steps you know where yeah. it's like we were climbing a mountain and finding our toehold at each place and right. our ambitions kind of getting more and more big like oh let's erase a, you know went from like let's cancel a million dollars of debt to wow 30 million to like oh let's get a few hundred million that'd be cool to like let's let's demand that 
Joe Biden, cancel it all. And, you know, again, we always had this radical horizon because of our origins in Occupy. <laughs> so the imagination was there, but like finding those little toeholds, you do that yeah. by experimenting. And like, we did a lot of things that didn't work. You know, um, we launched some debt strikes that changed the world. <laughs> for, you know, I know like when people get uh, $50,000 of debt relief, it's world changing, right? Like, yeah. can't, you know, we won, we've won, in the can, we've won billions and billions of dollars debt relief for students who yeah. were defrauded by predatory for-profit colleges. But yeah. we did some campaigns that just kind of didn't, you know, didn't take off. And, you know, that we had to go back to our little previous toehold and go again somewhere else. So um, I don't know, you have to break it into those bite-sized chunks, but, you know, you really have to be able to see sort of like, it's a weird way of seeing the world. Like what's in front of me that I can get to that aims at that radical horizon. And um and then, you know, mixing the messages of like, yeah, we're, we're, we're winning this little bit of debt relief now because we want a totally different world. Um, so I don't yeah, know. You know. It's a balance that, as, as, as organizers to keep that like the practical and the utopian horizon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Together. And the, it's and the dialectic realizing... or something. <laughs> well, we call it the double standard, right? Like you're <laughs> aiming for the stars, but you'll settle for somewhere down here and anywhere in that yeah. range is good. You know, anywhere um, that's, that's, you know, further along than the crap position we're in now, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but we, you have to keep going and, and but the ambition and, and like recalibrating the ambition you have, I think is also part of it. And that's what gets to the imagination that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so Ricardo, the transborder immigrant tool, I'll let you explain it, but like, there's a very practical part of it. Right. Um, or, and then there's. But the impact it had was like very indirect. Um, how did you, how did that evolve? How did you change it around as you went? Well, um, one of the elements that uh, was important in all the work is that it's always done by an anarchist vibe of artists. Uh, each gesture takes about 10 years from beginning to, to end from concept to construction, design to implementation. And so one of the uh, questions that emerged in, um, in conversations with the Zapatistas and indigenous futurity was uh, how could one um, reconfigure uh, global positioning systems and a locative media arts that if you remember the military gave civilian populations the right to GPS in 2000. Mm. So we began to investigate uh, what a GPS was, how it was being used, not only on a military level, but on a social level. And often it was urban based. It was like find the nearest sale of Starbucks coffee or what have you. Uh, another element that was being done by new media artists at that time was layering the GPS structure of, say, Palestine onto San Francisco so mm -hmm. that you would walk into a sketcher store and then find out that in Palestine that had been destroyed. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so but it was still very urban based and uh, working with uh, my longtime collaborator, Brett Stahlbaum, uh, Amy Sarah Carroll, Misha Cardenas and Eli Mermad, uh, we began to investigate how would an AI uh, be developed, a machine learning tool that would navigate not urban space, but the desert space, a desert-based technology, a walking technology in territories that um, were particularly concerning, say the Mexico-US border where many people walked and are dehydrated, lost, and, and obviously antagonized uh, by authorities. So one of the core decisions, as I, we mentioned earlier, you did, the question of poetry became uh, very important. And so in 2007, we decided to create the transporter immigrant tool, not as a global positioning system, but as a geopoetic system. Uh, because this, uh, and you have to remember, uh, telephones at that time, or cell phones were tiny. They couldn't even hold your images, much less uh, what your cell phones do now. So we had to compress a massive amount of data, uh, not only getting people to water stations, uh, getting people to safety zones, but also 
uh, Amy Sara Carroll created poetry based on military survival journals uh, that like Tom Cruise and Top Gun, he crashes in the desert, he's trained to survive in the desert. Mexican soldiers, uh, Israeli soldiers. So she took all these military manuals and created a desert survival poetry in 12 or 15 different languages, because it's not just Spanish that's predominant. There's Mexi, Mexi there's Nahua, Russian, Chinese, many different communities cross. And we compressed it all and worked with NGOs that leave water in the Anza Borrego area. We tested it for about two years and it was ready to go. Uh, then uh, it appeared in Vice, the magazine. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right-wing congressmen got very angry, Homeland Security, uh, my own university, UCSD, that I had just been hired for. And I told them I was going to do this. And they said, sure, it sounds cool, technology. Uh, but they don't hear the content, right? At these research areas, they just hear technology, technology, technology. But they don't hear content, content gesture. So yeah. they all got very angry. They tried to detenure us. They investigated us for several years. Um, but I think what the tool and the gesture did uh, was basically open what is a very long historical dialogue about the border, its militarization, its virtuality. And ultimately, uh, as many newspapers put out, uh, that the tool dissolved the border with its poetry. And hmm. so that ended up with the FBI reading poetry, uh, Congress reading poetry, uh, the university reading poetry, uh, and because they were very confused about what a geopoetic system was. Um, and so a lot of our time in the court and, and other places was just people reading poetry. And so ultimately they asked, is this poetry encrypted? We said all poetry is encrypted. Uh, I've read T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland for years and, and Shakespeare's sonnets. I still don't know who he's in love with. Or, um, so yes, uh, again, it's a micro gesture that then created uh, a, a great deal of institutional critique and uh, layers of power. Uh, in the end, we won. Um, all, uh, the, all of these things and uh, the lawyers, I had uh, five lawyers and they all learned so much about art uh, that they did it all pro bono after two years of, of work, which was oh, a wow. real a miracle, right? Uh, yeah. So again, um, uh, we always work as artists. It's always an anarchist five. It always takes about 10 years to create work. Uh, at this time, we're developing the palindrome because here in San Diego, uh, it's known as Drone Valley. We produced 80% mm -hmm. of all the drones that are being used to uh, survey, kill, and uh, for hobbyists. And so we're creating a drone that will chase down Homeland Security drones and sing to them the poetry and music of the border so that the pilots, uh, remote pilots in Nevada, uh, Chris Nevada can get a sense of what uh, the border might be. Uh, anyway, I'll stop there. No, you know, Ricardo, I'm reminded of a story that you told me and, you know, just like the ways that you're, um, like by insisting on adding the poetry port part, you're kind of jamming up the um, court system and like, you know what I mean? Like they have to reckon with this and interpret it. And there's a, there's a strategic part to that. And, uh, but the story you told me, I remember you were standing in a doorway, uh, the FBI were in your office and you had all your students in the hall and you insisted, if I remember this right, when the FBI asked you questions that you would ask the whole group and you would respond as a collective, which, um, you know, there's a the integrity to that around working as a collective but also it just like bogs down the questioning process and, um, and frustrates the FBI. Um, and th that's like a very small shift in like, I'm gonna, I'll answer your questions, but I need to do it this way. I work with these people, you know, it's like this small shift that like, again, has this big impact. How, I know, uh, I mean, how much can you talk? How much can you actually really talk about that? <laughs> well, I think it, you can, that is, um, 
the the way the aesthetic developed was always to as artists to think about the differences between transparency as an aesthetic uh, opacity as an aesthetic or camouflage and then what we uh, speak of as translucency that is that that moment between opacity and the transparent becomes for artists at least myself and the groups that I, we work with so again uh, part of it is how do we seek those liminal points of translucency where the community uh, can speak directly to what is secret, right? That is usually investigations, you're alone in a room with a group of authority, uh, but by performing, uh, Mr. Dominguez, that you use electronic civil disobedience to take down the Mexican government. Um, we would then open the door and ask the community outside. They're asking me if we as a community did a virtual sit-in and took down the Mexican government, then what should I say? And the people would go, yes, we all did it together. You know, uh, I am Spartacus or whatever it is yeah. that they, uh, and uh, so again, uh, exit culture is the moment in which you open the doors to the inner sanctum of different administrative power and allow the community to exchange, even if you become the kind of odd interface, the translucent interface. And so that's one of the things the Zapatistas in 94 began to train us in, that is, what is the poetics of collective effort of the imaginary, right, indigenous futurity. And so we saw the encuentros develop into the Battle of Seattle, uh, we saw it develop into indie media, which I think led to the amazing powers of, say, Occupy uh, and the kind of micro gestures that Nikolai, uh, Nikola, uh, Nikola is doing. Uh, they all carry the charge of creative poetics that activate communities um, to interface with power and begin to shift the conversations of how power responds. Uh, because they want to say, oh, you broke this law, you broke this electronic law. But suddenly you go, but it's really poetry, right? And that's its core. And you can read all these things about the poetry. So that shifts the articulation by which power then begins to imagine uh, and community begins to input. Um, so, I'll, for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this story. In 2000, we were asked by a uh, Tijuana community to border hack uh, uh border in 2000. So what we did is we looked at uh, US Custom and Border Patrol computers, and they all have what are called ports. Your computer right now has thousands, hundreds of thousands of ports. You just only use like two of them, right? So we would open, we would check to see what ports were open in those computers, uh -huh. and then we would shoot poetry uh, of the Zapatistas into the Border Patrol servers. So mm -hmm. they would say, this is against the law, what have you. But again, we were sharing cultural questions, cultural gestures uh, within their infrastructure of power. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I like that there's something about uh, to like carrying on a conversation on your own terms instead of submitting to the terms of the, you know, what's commonly understood. If I'm being interrogated by the FBI, it means I'm sitting in a room, there's a mirror, there's a light on my face, and I'm intimidated and I have to do this thing, you know, and and why? You know, like, it clearly didn't have to work that way for you. And I think those are the kinds of things that for Astra and Nicola, you're doing something similar, which is like, all right, there is a way that I'm supposed to think about debt, but why? You know, like, and then proving that it can be done another way or that this construction uh, thing is not up to me, you know, like we don't have control over it. and. Um, just to sort of assume like, well, all right, I'm going to go about this a different way. Um, I have some other questions, but as for Nicola, is like anything come up for your, you two? Well, I just wanted to echo Ricardo's, you know, also his invocation of, of the battle in Seattle inspiring Occupy. And I, that is, I think, just one thing always to highlight is how also our strange creative efforts and, and movements <laughs> sort of, you know, inspire and manifest in things that we can't anticipate. You know, there's some direct, mm -hmm. I mean, there's some really direct connections between Occupy and the Battle in Seattle and that some of the core folks helping to coordinate, not lead, but coordinate 
especially the occupation at Sakati Park, you know, were really directly involved in what happened in Seattle in 1999 and the movement against the World Trade Organization. Um, and, you know, passed on a kind of knowledge of how to be in collectivities and how to work together and how to have affinity groups and how to have the people's microphone, for example, <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and sort of passed on that knowledge. Um, you know, and I find that to be, that's something I always take a lot of inspiration from. It's like, yeah, even if you don't actually get the thing you're aiming at, you know, you might be planting these seeds that'll manifest in ways that you can't anticipate. Um, and, and the way that we, we uh, end up inspiring, yeah, inspiring future efforts and those connections between movements, even if it takes a while <laughs> for them to manifest. Oh, yeah, gonna, just we, briefly we talk to... about how valuable it is to learn from failure. But yeah. it doesn't have to be your own failure. It could also be someone else's. But it might not like, be uh, failure. And failure is, yeah. you know, not necessarily absolute. It might just be that you were ahead of your time, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I was going to say, I, I learned a lot in terms of these histories of affinity groups and whatnot from ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Uh, I learned about community research initiatives. I learned about, uh, you know, these kinds of gestures and, um and 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 they and they learn from the histories that were before them. So I think there is this uh, a really important connection on a global scale of how we learn from each other. Uh, you know, in the way that I I learned from the debt uh, actions and the the European uh, actions that are you know uh, very direct. And you know, I I I've been wanting universal pay, universal care, universal education, and global jubilee. Uh, and so I'm, I am always moved by, I'm on the listservs of the debt, I'm on the listservs and a lot of these things. So I'm always energized in my points of, uh, despondency. Um, uh, you know, like the penguin action I thought was just, uh, magical and aesthetically, uh, exciting. And I was going to tell Nicola, uh, I used to run into, uh, Federation of Gnome, uh, no, the Gnome Liberation Army. Uh, which used to uh, like took over Paris one year, took over uh, Sydney. Uh, so I just love the idea of these kind of magical figures like no mm -hmm. liberation army, uh, you know, enacting uh, the potential of speaking back to power. So anyway, I'll stop down. Um, well, Nicola, did you have something? Yeah, yeah I, I, I have. Just, just, just few few sentences about the failure is actually uh, just a way of learning, yeah. and it's very good if you can feel it. If you don't go too much inside in, in in something in some question, and you feel it in the beginning, then you it give you it give you a, a possibility to 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 go around feel it actually, and uh, and and this is what what Ricardo was saying. We are using. The, the same strategies all the time. So, you know, when everything is going wrong sometimes with the authorities, we're just artists, we're just, this is just penguins, this is just crafts, this is just sculptures by the end, you know. This is sculptures, people love them. So what you have, like something against art, you have something against sculptures in public place, okay, then you should speak, we will speak out on, on the base with association of artists, with everything, you know, make it cultural debate. Instead of instead of political debate, and and we sometimes uh, it's it's vice versa of that when we need to to do political debate about about some things, but it gives you a space actually to step back one or two steps and and restart, restructure uh, yourself, uh, reconfigure, and then and then and then continue. Yeah. So I'm, we have a lot of people that watch these that are earlier in their careers. Um, and I think talking about starting small is good, but we also talked about this like ambition and like, um, that it moves towards bigger things. How do you avoid starting small and it just staying small? <laughs> well, I think I, I personally think we're still small because we're still dealing with super small things. Like mm -hmm. a pet holes, like a water supply, like a garbage disposing. It's it's uh, one thing that we, uh, at least our group, 
is is very highly commented on helping people from occasion to occasion sometimes we are part of of bigger uh things but we are maybe initiating but then giving 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 space to to the other people yeah uh, uh astro ricardo what do you think how do you keep it from staying small i have a few well i'm not sure small is always bad <laughs> i think small is small is good and sometimes i mean the the deck like one of my things one of my mantras was that you know we didn't just want to go for breadth we wanted to go for for depth and i was thinking specifically at the time of groups like moveon.org or groups that you have this huge mailing list of a few million people you know they blast tons of folks and grow their list and ask for five bucks but you know i was like i'd rather have a hundred people devoted and really trying to do something cool <laughs> you know than a hundred thousand people on a list that are um you know, really not that deeply engaged. So I think, sure. you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's better or often it's better to have quality over quantity. So I think knowing when, like when is scale important? Scale is a tactic. <laughs> scale is, it's not like one side is virtuous, like, oh, small is yeah. beautiful and, and large is corrupt or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think scale is a tactic. So like, oh, are we aiming at something? You know, in the United States, there's a lot more than 2 million of us. Are we aiming at the federal level? in a strategic for a strategic reason or actually are we trying to build you know more intense relationships where we live um and i think we need both i think that ultimately to have the big change though you do need the small stuff you do need grounded social relationships like that's where mm -hmm. solidarity comes from it's between people mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you need those bonds to get the strength to have a, a more you know structural impact i guess when when question I would ask too in trying to get bigger is, well, what are you doing? Are you building actual power? <laughs> so another thing I was, you know, wanted to do was break out of what some of my friends and I would jokingly call the awareness industrial complex. Like we're raising awareness. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, we don't, we don't want people to be aware that people are suffering. We want to stop it. And you stop yep. things by building power and, you know, gumming things up. That's why we have this idea of economic disobedience. That's why we, you know, love, the labor movement and when it's militant and can strike and, and, you know, uh, uh, gum things up. And so I think, you know, more than saying, Hey, try to break out of being small. I'd say, you know, break out of raising awareness, yeah. <laughs> and try to yeah, build yeah. some real power. Uh, it, because that's, um, you know, that's critical. And then I, again, to go back to this idea that the small leads to the big, I mean, the debt collective has a model of service provision. You know, you can dispute your debt. You can dispute your credit score. We'll help you predatory debt collectors are harassing you and we build that trust and that solidarity on an individual level. We want to help people. We want people's lives to have a bit less pain in them, right? We want mm -hmm. you to have five bucks instead of this predatory debt collector having it. But that's how we build the cohesion and the trust to start pushing for bigger changes and, and building the trust required to take risks together, right? Because you have to have trust to take risks. And so that, yeah. um, you know, that is, it actually can be out of the small acts. And, you know, we're, there's a lot of inspiration for that, right? Like the Black Panthers and free lunch programs <laughs> and free breakfast programs. And, you know, yeah, you know, and not having that be the end. So it's not charity. You're not saying, oh, well, you know, we're helping you with your debt as an act of charity. We're doing it to build solidarity and to build that power. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think those, again, the dialectic, those scales are interwoven and we have to, have to navigate and we have to operate at both of them yeah you know well i, I think uh, uh for me i've always been more attached to the tactical than the strategic and to art as opposed to the larger question of activism even though i've been uh, an activist in that um activists have a deep knowledge of very specific information right and so you have mm -hmm. to uh, develop a conversation with those who know, right, who've been doing sort of the key strategic work. So the other is this kind of fractility of what I call relational non-relationality. That is often you have to work with groups who don't necessarily care about art, uh, don't care about uh, performance, transgressive risk or what have you. Uh, they are just, uh, uh, are some communities I, I've dealt with, they've seen Christ and they want to be Christ-like. So, mm -hmm. for instance, here in the Anza Borrego area, we have the right to leave water. 
Now, the reason we have a right to leave water in 2000 was that there's a very powerful right wing uh, family here who are uh, Congress people, uh, judges. And so they very quickly legalized leaving water on the border, right, which is different than Arizona. Now, if it had been Democrats or radicals, uh, Chicanas or Chicanos, they would have said, no way. There's no way to leave water out there. So we had to assemble the electronic disturbance data or conversation with community that disagrees on everything except leaving water and taking care and making sure that people survive. And they were freaked out at first. You bunch of communists using this weird technology, uh, poetry. But in the end, they became very interested about mm -hmm. what this kind of gesture could do. So I think that part of the fractility is that you sometimes have to build alliances and coalitions, uh, but also always be out of the closet. Well, we're artists, right? Mm -hmm. And that's we think about the colors and, you know, uh, as uh, maybe Astra and others, is it a sculpture? Is it a, is it a word? And certainly uh, for us, the Zapatistas have been very clear that our, uh, our words are our weapons, right? As the Zapatistas say. And mm -hmm. one of the things that happens in fractility is that gestures that one has created in the past come back as certain kind of questions. <clears throat> so for instance, last month I spent time with Greenpeace in Europe because they're developing an electronic civil disobedience component, but they mm -hmm. didn't really know much about electronic civil disobedience or its history or how it worked in a transparent manner, not an anonymous kind of uh, and a uh, uh, secret yeah. level, right? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, here they've, I've been speaking to them about what we've done and what legal outcomes have occurred. So I never expected to sit around with Greenpeace who knows about civil disobedience and is very uh, sort of has a history of doing it, but they get freaked out about electronic civil disobedience, right? Their community is used to you putting boats out in front of giant uh, yeah. I don't know, oil machines. They're, Yellow they're used to black text yeah, uh, tying them. yourself to doors or protesting EU. But once you put electronic in front of it, most of their community is rather freaked out. So how do they develop a language that they say civil disobedience in the streets, in the ocean, is similar to electronic civil disobedience. But people are scared about their data bodies. In the same yeah. way they're scared about their debt, in the same way they're scared about these things, right? The data body is a site of cyber terrorism, cyber crime, cyber war. So, and then I'll end with this. Uh, right now, I'm working with uh, indigenous communities in Oaxaca and in Chiapas around what is called Tren Maya, the Mayan train. And one of the things about our culture is extractivism. Right. The indigenous territories are places where we take uranium, lithium, uh, everything. And so they're trying to create a tourist train. That's the excuse through Oaxaca and Chiapas, who will also become highly militarized. Uh, and we know this because there was a big hack leak that just happened last week. Uh, you know, uh, terabytes of military Mexican information about mm. what they want to do to the indigenous. So that's one sort of element that we have to start working with archaeologists, working with activists, indigenous communities. But it's going to take a while to develop a, a gesture that takes on this kind of. Uh, uh, so it's it's speculative uh, that yeah. we work on, and also speculative thinking around the work that activists do deep diving in, and know. And, and then being aware that we might have to work with people we don't necessarily agree with, but find the point of leverage to contest. Uh, don't take uh, the indigenous lands or what have you. Um, I'll right. stop there. Clean the water, get the arsenic mm -hmm. out of the water or whatever the case may mm -hmm. be. Um, I, the thing I hear you all saying is like building relationships with people that are in other fields, right? And um, you know, you described it as building power, um, Astra, and, and and it's very strategic, right? Like, Nicola, you get something started, and then some other organization can either join or take it over. Um, and at the Center for Artistic Activism, we've been 
talking about how raising awareness isn't enough for like a, over a decade. Um, the thing I usually use is like talking about if you're wandering in the desert and then I came up and explained to you how dehydration worked. Like, would that be enough? Like you're now aware that you're dehydrated um, or do you want to be taken to water? Um, so, uh, and then, yeah, building these coalitions, building alliances. And, and I think the, uh, the combination of being very practical about what can we actually get done um, uh, that would make a difference, that would change behaviors, that would get policies in place, and then strategically thinking like, okay, is staying, and I thought that was a great point, Astra, like is staying small smart here, or is would scaling up actually help us get that? Yeah. And one of the things that came out of the transporter immigrant tool was the question of research and practice. What are its limits? So what I got from the university trying to remove me or detenure me was that it was okay to count how many people are dying in the desert, right? It was okay to say that they wouldn't die if they had water or support or safety to reach their goal. But it was not research and practice to go out there and give them a water bottle and lead them to safety, yeah. right? So then the question became, what are the ethics of a research one university? in which you can only count the bodies, indicate why there are bodies, but not do anything about it, right? And so I think if I'm gonna think strategically is to push the ethics of research one universities beyond the quote unquote counting and, 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 and critical consideration of why that is and into an accounting of why we don't do the actual giving of the water or the, you know, so I'll stop there. One of the things just I've been thinking about recently is that when you are talking about a problem as an artist, it's art, you know, like I'm depicting this, I'm researching it, I'm showing this as you, when you try to do something about it or change it, then it becomes, then you open it up where people can question whether or not it's actually art. And I think that's um, not a great thing for our definition of art in this culture, but Astra, you look like you had something to say. Oh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I definitely resonate with that. I mean, as I said, when Occupy started, I was a filmmaker. I was making, you know, documentary films about philosophy. And um, and in fact, one of the things that motivated me was a lot of people were asking me, well, hey, you're, you're at Occupy a lot. Are you going to make a documentary film? And I suppose I could have made a more participant observatory one, but I had this sense that what they were saying was stand on the sidelines, you know, and document <laughs> with that detached, remote perspective. And I just felt like, no, I'm going to jump right in there and just paddle as hard as I, I can, like, you know, because like, what, what else, you know, it's like we had 10, 10 years of the odds where there's no, no, you know, it was just so depressing to protest, uh, yeah. you know, and, you know, I just was like, no, I'm going to pick a side, you know, and yes, you know, this movement has aspects that are you know, it's not the movement I would conjure if I was all powerful. It's got its foibles and stuff. But, you know, it, it, that, that's it. Like, I'm, I'm throwing down with it. And I've always had enough of a toehold as a journalist, too, that I can kind of straddle that line. But I've gotten plenty of pushback from editors at mainstream publications where they're like, well, actually, we're just not looking for the activist perspective as though somehow I'm so corrupted and, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, if I had no experience trying to mobilize against power, I would somehow be more objective. Whereas I think actually it gives you a huge amount of expertise and credibility to know what it's like to go against power. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it makes you more of an expert. Um, and I think, you know, having a state can make your art more meaningful, more expressive, right? You know, more rich than a, a, this incredibly ideological idea of neutrality. So, you know, of course it doesn't mean we don't care about facts and we don't try to be, you know, grounded yeah. in some reality but yeah like you know there's no neutrality i mean it's a howard zinn thing there's no ne there's no neutral on a moving train and um you know and, and for me ultimately i think all of these things feed on you know i think i'm a better i think i'm more creative because i've, I've been involved in organizing i think I, organizing is a really interesting creative outlet i think that um the stakes you know the stakes don't diminish you <laughs> they, they just enrich you um yeah but, yeah. but um, anyway, but yeah, it's a constant, a constant battle for me. Uh, you know, this, this idea that, 
somehow you're you're less credible as a sort of public voice because you've chosen a side in a fight. When we were starting and our all the now artist activists and, and artists who are coming out of the of the comfort of the galleries and museums and, and, and similar things was important to try to do something, important to try to change something. It's much better to try than not, because if you don't try, you know, you never know, will something happen? We speak, it's, it's a hope. They have a hope that someone who is similar like them, without any backup, without any special knowledge, special, mm -hmm. I don't know what, uh, special background member of political party can can change the things and that hope that hope uh, at least for for our society is 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 very important because because more and more people are trying to to be creative in their efforts for solving solving their problems you can see flowers in the in the potholes all around the balkans 10 years after you can see many NGO civil society actors trying to to create art actions. Some are successful, some are not. But approach is has been changed. Approach to the problem yeah. and 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 point of view of of common people now is is more and more open for art for culture and they start more and more people think on culture as a tool that can improve quality of life. Even the authorities that can make change in the society and make positive positive things in the in the in the society it's really hard to understand what how true that is in macedonia without actually like knowing what came before and the impact that you guys have had but it is true no, Team, something, something something's works. better than nothing yeah. is always something a good motto better than nothing. yeah <laughs> Yeah, and we try to do something. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Um, it definitely gave me something to think about, especially the start small and staying small. I often uh, try to be as ambitious as possible just because I, I, with so much work, I want to, it to have that kind of impact. Um, but also, you know, maybe this gives you an idea of what Guinness World Record could you set? Um, what like small use of technology could you do that maybe would get a uh, massive reaction uh, in the press? Um, and what's something that you're working on now that could get to the point where it becomes part of the national conversation, right? What if that was to happen? How could that happen? Um, that's why we do this. At the Center for Artistic Activism, um, we want to inspire uh, you to be more effective with your activism through creativity, through culture, through innovation. And we are a 5013C nonprofit organization, which means um, that we rely on the support of people like you and organizations. Um, and it's really important to us to be able to give away these resources for free. We want them to be accessible, uh, both in content, but also, uh, you know, we don't want finances to be a barrier for the kind of people that we're working with. So if you are able to chip in a bit, you can donate at our site um, at c4aa.org slash donate. And if you work with an organization or represent an organization and want to find a way to support us more uh, collaboratively, um, please get in touch. And uh, thank you for watching this and look for the others. There are more in this series uh, if you enjoyed it and I hope you check those out. And I also wanna quickly thank the Four Doves Foundation and Andrea Soros Columbell who helped make this series of revolutionizing activism possible. Thanks.